Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. We're actually a few minutes behind in getting going. I want to welcome you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your Monday afternoon to stop by for our OER workshop. Um, what we're hoping is that we'll give you a little bit of taste of how, of how OER is being used in different courses and in different disciplines here at UTSA through um, our grant program at the UTSA Libraries. I'm Deanne Ivey, I am the OER coordinator and I'm a social sciences librarian and I um, lead the OER effort in the library and coordinate that among the subject specialist librarians. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our grant program just to give you an idea of the size and scope of that. So to date, we have actually awarded 47 grants across different areas for different courses. Some of those were individual grants, some of them were group grants, where there was implementation across all sections of a course in a department, which is really amazing. Um, we have saved six and a half million dollars through the grant program just since, since its inception in 2016. And we have a return on investment of uh, $72 for every dollar that we've invested in that program. So it's really amazing. I think when you hear the numbers and how much work is going into being save, uh, saving students money, um, it's really impressive. I wanted to highlight a couple of courses that um, have been partic particularly impressive through the grant program as far as savings. Um, we have our biology faculty are doing some amazing work implementing in uh, first and second semester bio courses. And I pulled some quick numbers. I, I uh, spoke to Dr. Jaffe just uh, quickly. Um, I know he'll correct me if I'm wrong on any of these numbers, but they um, annually see 2,300 students in those classes. Um, and actually maybe, I think it may be closer to double that, 4,600. The previous textbook cost $180 for that class. They've been implementing OpenStax across all sections of the courses. And in just one semester, they've been able to save students half a million dollars just through implementation of a, an adoption of an OpenStax textbook. So it really helps the students. It really helps make a difference. The Math Matters program has also been using OER for quite some time. Um, they have implemented in the Math 1073, which is the Algebra for Scientists and Engineers, and in Math for Business. And they're saving about um, half a million every semester with both of those courses as well. So pretty amazing um, the amount of work that's going into this and the savings that we're seeing for, for these classes. What we're working on this semester um, is actually sharing these stories out a little bit more so that you get an idea of the work that's happening with other classes. So you may have noticed we sent several emails out over the, over the last few weeks kind of promoting the grant program and talking a little bit about our existing faculty textbook heroes. So we're kind of going through and creating profiles on our website, of uh, the main website for the grant program, talking about faculty and the work that you guys are doing, um, implementing OER. So we're gonna be sharing that out a little bit more. We're actually working on an OER advocacy video. Um, so we'll have, hopefully have that finished by end of summer or so, and we'll have that up on our website as well. We'll be using that next year whenever we promote the grants, to, so you can get an idea of some of the other work that's being done by faculty. Um, and I wanted to talk just quickly about some of the numbers uh, as far as nationally. Typically what we see with OER, the national studies, students do the same or better um, in those courses that are adopting OER. And our data here at UTSA, we are collecting data for our classes that are implementing OER, and it does reflect this very same thing. Um, our students, we submit a survey to all classes that are adopting OER. Um, and students complete that survey. It's about 20 questions. And students rate um, the following as very important to them. And um, I'll go ahead and give the percentage for each one. So as far as price and cost, 80% of the students rated that as very important. Accessibility, 65%. And we're talking about, there were about 2,500 responses we have received to date um, through these OER surveys of our students taking classes, these classes. Um, Layout of the text, 56%. Practice material, 69%. Free and available the first day of class, 80% um, rated that as very important to them. So not, not surprising, but it's, it's really nice to see these UTSA specific numbers, I think. Unlimited printing, 61%. And then availability after the course, 50% rated that as very important to them. Um, some other things that I will say about our students taking OER classes, a quarter of those 2,500 students 
um, reported they are receiving their financial aid the second, third, and fourth week of classes. So many, a quarter of them are not getting their money right away to purchase the books. So I think that's important to note. And then about 30% of those 2,500 respondents um, are receiving Pell Grants. So um, another important thing to note. So you may have noticed that um, President Amy and his wife have uh, actually uh, contributed to our OER grant through the library. So there's some notice being taken by administration of the work that, that is being done with OER and in these classes. And then we're also doing uh, crowdfunding with Student Government Association. We launched crowdfunding last spring. I think we're going to try it again this fall. We're talking with SGA to help raise more, more funds for faculty that are adopting OER so we can use that to supplement what the library uh, budgets for OER. So, um, and then just to note, there's work being done at the state level, a lot of work. Our dean, Dean Hendricks, is a huge advocate for OER adoption, and he is actually co-chair of the UT System Affordable Learning Accelerator Task Force. So they're looking at getting more funding for faculty that are doing this, getting things like time off to adopt OER. Um, and they're looking at other options, like inclusive access options, where there is a reduced rate um, for, for available through publishers. So um, there was also a report that was submitted to the chancellor to advocate for increased support at the UD system level. That was submitted last uh, spring. Um, so a lot of work that's being done. So today, I'm really excited. We have uh, David Harris, who's the editor-in-chief at OpenStax going to talk with us a little bit about trends in OER, and um, I'll talk a little bit about David um, just to kind of give you some background on him. He hasn't just worked at OpenStax, he has a lot of experience um, with uh, OER and uh, course learning um, textbooks. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Connecticut, has worked extensively in higher education publishing. Um, during his long career, David has served in a range of leadership roles, allowing him to collaborate with the best authors, editorial groups, and media development teams in the industry. At OpenStax, David leads efforts to improve access to high quality materials by working with authors, developers, and partners to substantially lower costs for students. During his tenure, he has led the development of 29 titles and counting that have saved students $342 million since 2012. As OpenStax continues to expand, David has been instrumental in identifying key areas of growth and improvement in leading OpenStax to a sustainable future through the development of the OpenStax Partner Program. And then after David speaks, we'll have some of our faculty come up and showcase some of their work they're doing for their classes. So join me in welcoming David. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure uh, to be uh, with you today and talk about trends in OER and what we're seeing uh, you know, across, across the nation. Uh, so I'm the editor-in-chief for OpenStax, and just a few words about OpenStax. We're a nonprofit publisher. Uh, we're based out of uh, Rice University uh, in uh, Houston, Texas, and OpenStax uh, has been uh, publishing uh, OER uh, in, in our current uh, form uh, since uh, 2012. We'll get into that. So what I thought we'd do today is provide you with an update on the state of uh, OER and OpenStax today and uh, some of the major trends that we see. Uh, and then finally, uh, look at uh, online learning and how technology and OER are starting to converge together. Uh, we're seeing quite a lot of uh, developments uh, in that area. Uh, before I begin, does anyone have any questions uh, that you'd be wanting to ask about OER or OpenStax in particular that I can make sure I get to today? Good. I have a question. Okay, sure. In my field, and I don't see a lot of materials that I could use right now, yep. so I want to know how to work through that. And what field are you in? in art history. In art history. Okay. And we can, I'll make sure we get to that. Sometimes it's a, right is, a rights issue, uh, the, uh, getting uh, openly licensed content in art history and literature uh, can be very challenging. Okay, so b b before we begin, uh, first of all, huge congratulations uh, to UT San Antonio. This is a list of the courses uh, that have used or are using uh, OpenStax resources. And this is a very impressive uh, number, uh, to, uh, to be frank. Uh, it shows a great diversity of support. And I think uh, that the grant program has helped. I think the library support and really the engagement of the community and, of course, the faculty is really impressive. This year alone, if we look at the number of students, at, um, 
um, um, at San Antonio that are using OpenStax resources, they've saved around $750,000. Uh, and we calculate that as about $70 per student uh, per course. Uh, and some people say, but the textbooks are $200. Why do you discount it so much? Because some students don't purchase, some students rent, et cetera. So we try and be very conservative uh, with that number. But you should feel terrific about this. Uh, this is a leading, uh, a leading position and uh, uh, something that uh, a lot of institutions are striving for. And I think uh, that it's just the beginning. So let's, um, uh, let's provide you with an OpenStax uh, update here uh, in terms of how are we doing uh, nationwide. Well, it's great news overall. Uh, over 6,100 institutions are using OpenStax resources. Uh, this year alone, we're about 2.7 million students uh, in courses are using them across our 30 disciplines. So the community has really embraced this. And today, when we go through this, I think you'll see that we're now getting communities of practice around the OER. So it's not just about producing a textbook, it's about uh, creating a whole experience and curriculum for students. And that's very, very exciting. Uh, so the frequent question we get, and it came up this morning, well, will OER decline when the grants run out? Because all of the materials that we produce, if you're giving away uh, free textbooks, or a free biology book, uh, and there's no charge for the student, and there never will be a charge. Obviously, it takes a grant to develop that. Uh, and so what our friends in the publishing industry say, well, just wait until next year, they won't be around. Well, it's not sustainable. Well, the good news is actually it is sustainable. Uh, with, the, with the level of um, income that we're getting, uh, which I'll get to in a second, we can maintain the library and improve the books every single year. And we do annual updates. And how do we do that? Uh, well, uh, there's sustainability funding. So uh, OpenStax has partners, we have about 50 ecosystem partners now that provide services around the OER content. Uh, maybe uh, they use uh, OpenStax plus an online homework solution like WebAssign or Expert TA, which is still greatly reduced. You can still save the students $70, $80 if you go that path. When they sell that component with an OpenStax resource, these organizations, we call them allies, provide a small mission support fee back to OpenStax. And at scale, which we're now at scale, that makes us sustainable. Uh, we also do uh, very few uh, new additions. Uh, we update them annually, but we were talking about it this morning. Uh, college algebra-based physics honestly doesn't change. And you don't need to do revisions every three years. And we don't do that. We don't have to go through that expense. We do do annual updates of all the titles, uh, but we don't have to go through all the cost of, of revising them. There's no sales reps. Uh, you'll never see an OpenStack sales rep. As we like to say, if they're bringing you donuts, it's probably not OER. Uh, there's uh, uh, no physical comp copies. Uh, we've greatly reduced that. This is one of the big burdens of the industry. So on 2.6 million students, Typically, the publishers would probably have to give out around 150,000 free units to generate that amount of um, uh, sales of those physical books. And guess who pays for those free books? The students do. It is a big part of the, uh, the textbook cost. So when you get a free book, uh, your students are paying for that. And the communities really responded and said, okay, we can use the digital version or I'll purchase my own print. Um, version and that really has made OpenStack sustainable. And as I said, no fancy parties or free food, I'm afraid, uh, but can't get everything. And no transparency acetates. It's okay. So uh, let's uh, let's now evolve into uh, the access pieces rapidly being sold for students. We want to make. You've got at, at UTSA, uh, you have a high proportion of first generation students. A lot of students on Pell grants. Uh, so access is key to them. Uh, and not being able to afford those course <coughs> materials is a major problem. Uh, and it sometimes can be the tipping factor between how many courses uh, they take. And I think together we're solving this. The question <coughs> is, is how does OER improve and drive learning? Uh, and uh, there's a lot of studies going on uh, right now uh, to kind of set the stage for this. So something we do know is that with the high cost of textbook, it has a terribly negative impact on uh, student behavior. 47.6% take fewer courses. 
some won't register into a course, or they just won't purchase the course materials. Uh, that, that number gets as high as 70% in cases. And that really puts them at a disadvantage in the beginning of the semester. Uh, and that's why I think uh, the, uh, some are responding with the inclusive access. But that's another uh, whole story. So what's the impact? Uh, we are seeing more studies that are being taken. Uh, and uh, these are just a few studies. And I'll send you the links to this. And so basically what they're showing is that it helps students take an increase a number of credits. Obviously, they get they have the more money they can invest uh, in the courses. Uh, now, this is not the case if only one OER is adopted at a school. It has to be a comprehensive strategy uh, for these numbers to apply. And then uh, lower withdrawal rates too, uh, and that's part of that access uh, at the beginning of the um, at the beginning of the semester. Uh, so, through eleven peer-reviewed studies of about forty-eight thousand. Uh, students, 93% uh, of the students did as well or better uh, using OER. So that is really encouraging. Now, sometimes our, um, our, our publishing friends uh, flip that around and they will say, well, look, if the students are doing as well, uh, let's say the students are doing as well with OER, well, we're going to go through all this work uh, to make the change. You could just continue to do what you're doing. Well, I don't know if I buy that. Why would I spend $200 or $180 to get the same result? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, you know, I guess that's a conversation we don't want to have with them too often. Okay, so this is a very interesting study from University of Georgia that was published last year. Uh, 21,000 students. Uh, the University System of Georgia uh, has probably uh, the most uh, comprehensive uh, OER initiative in the nation. And uh, they actually rank number two of all the systems that we work with in, in terms of uh, improving access and annual savings uh, for students. Uh, but they did, this, uh, they did this study, and it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, when they looked at it across all students, uh, they saw that uh, the DFW rate uh, decreased by 2.68%. Uh, but if you look at the Pell eligible um, score, uh, that decreased by negative uh, 4.4, and the part-time students, negative 10%. Um, and then look at the positive impact uh, on the grades. And so this is very, very encouraging. So when you look at it from an equity perspective, OER, and students who are at risk, it has a disproportionate benefit uh, to that group. Uh, it's a great equalizer in that regard. And uh, I think you're going to see more and more studies over the uh, next, um, uh, next couple of years uh, uh, along these lines. Okay, so the next question we always get on a national level is who is con in control of the courses? Uh, so, a disclaimer, uh, OpenStax being based at Rice University, uh, we are 100% supportive of academic freedom. Uh, we don't believe OER should ever be mandated or legislated. Uh, it's really up to the individual professor to decide what's best for that course. So we actually actively work against uh, those initiatives that try to mandate the use of any course uh, materials. Uh, and in fact, we see OER as an opportunity to enhance academic freedom. Uh, so, uh, so how does it do it? Well, libraries are at the f uh, forefront of curation and adaptation across the country. Very impressive, and we see it all over, that they will work with faculty to help them uh, adapt the OER so it really reflects their, uh, their teaching and their curriculum. And it provides them with more choice without having to get permission from the content developer. Uh, so that's, a, that's, that's one way. Uh, for students, they have the freedom because they have immediate access and permanent <coughs> access. Uh, you mentioned inclusive access um, earlier. There's a reason why they don't call it inclusive and permanent access. You know why? Because you don't have permanent access. And it's one of the things I've never understood, and I'd always love to ask the publishers this. If I purchase a Kindle version of a closed resource on Amazon, let's say it's a trade book, you know, a best-selling trade book, I own it. Okay, it's the same digital transmission of content, but my textbook, you don't let me own it on my Kindle. Why is that? Why do I have to rent it for a certain amount of time? Uh, we just think that's inherently unfair. We think if you purchase it, you should always have access to it. 
Uh, so uh, we are seeing this, the publishers softening this a little bit, but I think they can go a lot further and offer permanent access uh, to students uh, all the time. Uh, the standard scope and sequence of emerging OER, like OpenStax, is going to be a lot more reflective of what is available uh, uh, in your courses. It's going to be much more aligned than it was before, and then you can adapt it uh, locally to really uh, make sure that it works. You have a much greater variety of platform choice now uh, with OER uh, than you do with a proprietary publisher. What does that mean? So if you are teaching an uh, intro biology course and you like Campbell Biology and you want to use that with a platform other than Mastering Biology, guess what the answer is? No. Or you like Mastering Biology but you'd like to use it with a non-Pearson author, guess what the answer is? No. Okay, OER is different. You can adopt OER, multiple versions of OER, or multiple authors of OER, and you can match it to dozens now of platforms. So you have much greater control than you ever had before. Uh, and, we've, and people, once they realize this, they find it uh, quite uh, liberating. And then um, the ownership of the content, obviously for you, is forever. Uh, and I think this is very important uh, because, let's say OpenStax goes away. You know, the publishers love saying OpenStax is going to go away. They've been predicting that for a long time. Uh, but since it's openly licensed, you actually own it. It's a public property. It's a public good now. And we actually think that knowledge, that basic knowledge, is a public good. And it should remain public. Uh, and then moving to a new edition is optional. Uh, in some markets, we have to revise them, but it's optional. You always have access uh, to prior editions. So we see OER as really enhancing academic freedom. So let's talk about adaptation. It's very interesting you talked about the crowdsourcing because this is actually an example of that. So we have the OpenStax uh, chemistry uh, textbook. This is a general chemistry textbook, authors out of, uh, original authors uh, out of Purdue. And, uh, and uh, the University of Connecticut, which has really uh, uh, come on board a lot with OER, uh, has, got, has a lot of usage, but they didn't have chemistry. And a lot of students came together, the student government said, oh, we wish we could get access to this in our general chemistry course. But they had a pedagogical difference. They teach that course doing what's called Adams First. And so the student government actually funded the adaptation of that. And now we have an Adams First general chemistry book. Uh, it was quite amazing, actually. That actually uh, uh, that that made the news. It was so so significant that the students invested in that. Now they've been using that for a couple of years. Here's another example from University of Oklahoma. We have a basic introductory um, statistics book, uh, but they teach many more students in business statistics, and so they adapted it. And now we have uh, introductory business. The point here is is that you don't have to settle. Uh, you can adapt and you can uh, really make sure that the OER reflects what you're doing. And the grant program that you, that you have here affords you to be able to do that and provides you with the resources to do it. In addition, what OpenStax can provide you is all of the source files and the source art. So if you do adaptation, uh, you don't have to go and recreate uh, anything. You can really go in and edit it. Uh, localization. Here's an example where it's being uh, localized uh, into Spanish. And then if you go and post it, uh, more and more people are using YouTube to help uh, students instruct. You can go and post it without violating copyright. We know of in um, in instances where uh, faculty have taken publisher resources, posted them on YouTube, and get uh, cease and desist orders. Okay, not very friendly. I don't think it's a good way to establish a warm and fuzzy relationship. But they ha have every right to do it. Uh, because it's all rights reserved. Uh, we just think it's better if you have all the rights uh, and not the creator of it. And then another area that we're seeing, uh, we talked about this community of practice. This is an example of OER Commons OpenStax hubs. So the community is coming together in a big way now and developing a lot of different resources around this. It used to be when we started out, the concern was, well, you don't have as much ancillary support as the major publishers do. And in the beginning that was true, but actually now it's different. Uh, we, uh, with, uh, with physics, we have 148 affiliated resources. These are labs, 
worksheets, extra problems, uh, PowerPoint slides, uh, simulations uh, that support this book that was created by the community, openly licensed, free for your students to access. We have an incredible wealth of uh, resources available. And these are available now with every single one of our titles. And so if some people ask, well, how can we give back? Uh, well, the first way you can give back is make sure that you assign it to your students uh, so that they can benefit from it. But the second way is if you develop material, put it out into the comments because uh, then this all grows together and it takes a life of its own. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is an, as an expanded selection of resources. Uh, great. Uh, and so it's not only OpenStax now, and we encourage you to look at all OER materials. Uh, this is an example from mathematics. So you have and Ziegler, uh, Lyrics out of Canada, Linear Algebra. These are all open resources uh, that you can use. You can go well beyond OpenStax, and we encourage you uh, to do that. And so the overall pressure is on, the prices are coming down. For the, this is a study from AI. For the first time in 50 years, uh, we're seeing uh, the prices drop. And that's remarkable. And that's another point I'd make. It's sometimes difficult to get OER adopted. You might have a big committee. Uh, that sometimes happens. And so the question uh, is, how do we still improve access for students? Well, you just need to say one word to your publishing friend. And guess what that is? OpenStax or OER. We're looking at OER. And you can see a 30% deduction in price very, very quickly. Uh, and how, do we feel, how does OpenStax feel about that? Terrific, because that's our mission. Our mission is to well, try and get the cost as low as possible for students. So if you're still using a proprietary uh, content base, uh, and it's just difficult to make that change, just mention OER, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can still help your students. Uh, so what does permanent disruption mean like? Now that we, there is disruption, total disruption, in the marketplace, it means that no one's locked into a specific author or platform. Students have 100% control. You have free adaptation, and we have increased competition in this dynamic marketplace. We've moved from this monolithic model, where too few control too much, to a market is much more distributed. Drives choice, innovation, affordability, etc. We have to keep nurturing this, because it's actually a very fragile thing. Uh, and uh, that's one of our, our key drivers. So let's close out here uh, with technology, because technology is playing an increasing role in all of our classes, uh, blended technology uh, in particular. And uh, we know it's not just about textbook anymore. We use the word textbook, but that's all encompassing. We mean the experience, the curriculum experience for students. So here's an example, just a few from mathematics, web works, assessments, a GeoGebra, a D2L. Uh, you have, uh, well, non-mathematics, Canvas, a lot of open code, open resources uh, that can be used uh, for, uh, for local use at a fraction of the cost of proprietary. OER embedded into LMS. You use Blackboard here, right? Okay. Uh, this is an example uh, of, of a Canvas uh, innovation that the entire community college district of California did with OpenStax resources. They took all of our materials and put them into can Canvas cartridges uh, so that it could just be plug and play and it works beautifully uh, within, within Canvas. And uh, uh, we also have uh, Blackboard cartridges too. And down at the module level, everything is created so it's very modular and we could get into that later if we wanted to. But technology challenges do remain in regards to learning technologies, online homework platform, courseware, um, et cetera. Uh, so with technology, balancing skills, modeling, and reasoning, uh, this is very important across uh, many domains. Uh, technology is better, actually, at assessing skills than it is at assessing reasoning and modeling. And, uh, and how do you balance those in very large courses? Configuration requirements can vary greatly. If you're using an LMS, an additional courseware, those two need to sync up, and that configuration varies by campus to campus. That's a major challenge. Uh, Rules-based leg uh, legacy systems are limiting. What do I mean by that? Uh, in, let's say, physics, for example, you could have a response, a student could provide a response in a form that has two equivalent equals, uh, but, but if the system is very rules-based, it will only accept one. 
or in mathematics, uh, there are multiple steps you could do to arrive at a, at, a, at a response, and they're all mathematically reasonable, but rules-based systems will only accept one path. It's not very natural, and so this is a challenge with the technology. Uh, so the other thing is increasing complexity with technology. The truth of the matter is, is in, in proprietary or legacy systems, it's market share gains that are driving the technology development. What do I mean by that? So they come to UTSA, you've got a thousand students in your course, and you say, I've got to have X functionality. And the legacy provider will say, I'll get that for you. Now they go over to TAMU, and they say, well, I need X, Y, and Z. And they say, oh, well, I'll get that for you. So then you get these systems that get enormous and get very difficult to maintain. Uh, and the problem is, you are paying for all of the functionality, even though you may only use 20% of it. And so, one of the advantages of being a nonprofit is what I call the scarcity of resources, in that it allows us, when we're thinking about new technologies, to focus on that 20% that you really need, and we don't need to provide any more. And if you need more than that, and then you can expand out into that, into that ecosystem. Uh, balancing efficacy data with privacy. This is a major issue, one that uh, we're encouraging everyone to think about, especially with open data policies. You're rapidly, if you're using um, proprietary software or courseware in your courses, you're rapidly entering a period in which the vendor will know more about your students than you do. Think about that. The vendor knows more about your students than you do. How do you feel about that? What are they doing with that data? Who are they sharing that data with? Uh, as, and uh, this is especially important if you're signing long-term contracts. Uh, it's something that's gonna come about, it's gonna be, there's gonna be major issues around this in the next 18 months, why? There's gonna be some type of data breach, uh, or there's going to be some selling of data, uh, and it's all gonna come to the fore. So remember, you heard that here first. Uh, uh, data privacy is critically important. Uh, subscription costs are uh, steadily increasing. And then the final one here is very difficult to solve, maintaining academic integrity with technology. If you go in today, if you go into an OpenStax calculus book and you take the problem and you put it to Google, you will get the answer to that specific question within four seconds. And, uh, the same is true if it was uh, non-open resources. And so you can go and do great on your homework and then you don't do so great on your um, your, your uh, summative assessment. So that's a big problem, and uh, we don't have the answer to that one. And it's something that we have to, we have to think about when we're developing new, pa new uh, pedagogies. So just closing up here, so what will the OpenStax technology priorities be? Well, learning is gonna be the priority, and we've always said that from the beginning with OpenStax. Uh, free is not the priority, learning is, and it is the same, technology is not the priority, learning is. Uh, we'll always make sure that the content remains open uh, and adaptable for you. Uh, it's going to support accessibility requirements. We're going to try and utilize open code as much as possible so that you can configure it more easily uh, to your institution. And we're going to pursue sustainable, low-cost models uh, with access until students pass. It's not possible for a nonprofit to develop uh, the commercial-grade courseware that is free. So the question is, is how low can we get it um, with all of the materials? We're hoping we can keep it under $25. Uh, and then uh, non-proprietary, open to share the unique components with it, with the entire community, uh, which will be revolutionary. And so I think you're gonna see this coming online uh, probably, uh, well, uh, uh, in 2019. So we're excited about that. So that kind of gives you the overview. Did we do it in 20 minutes? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Any questions? Do we have time for one question? Okay. No questions. Oh, yeah, one. Okay. Okay, so you were talking about the textbooks are low cost to no cost. They're no cost. And, and then the supporting um, technology, so things like homework systems yeah. or... So what, is, what does it look like now? You said that you're trying to keep it as low cost as possible. Yeah. Who is actually creating those systems? That's a great question. So what, uh, what discipline are you in? Uh, I'm in languages. Uh, okay, in languages. Okay, so I'm not as familiar with those markets. Let me pick one that I do know. 
Uh, so let's say biology, uh, physics would be an example. So we have a partnership with WebAssign uh, that also works with all the other major publishers and uh, it's online homework. They go in, they get a problem, most likely from the textbook, uh, they try and solve it, it grades it incorrectly, uh, and then they, um, and then they, they go and get, they, they get a grade, it's part of their grade. Uh, those resources, when they're bundled with OER, uh, sell for about $45, $50. When it's bundled with a commercial tax, it's about $125. So you still save 70, you still save $70. So what I was describing there is a model in which we take different components, open source code, maybe we take something from OpenEx Open for the management piece, uh, we'll work with some third party partner that might have something that allows students to, uh, that's got AI behind it, to answer questions. We assemble these together, and as a nonprofit, and we don't have salespeople, we can get that cost down to $20, $25. Uh, so we're running experiments now on this, and we'll have a lot more information on that uh, next year. But it needs to look like, basically what we want to do is we want to deliver an experience as a better than a legacy system at a fraction of the cost, but we can't do it for free, that's the problem. Right. Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, these are systems that already exist already. in the proprietary system that are being adapted for the OER textbook. Great. So they're, they're proprietary systems that they say, okay, instead of using a closed textbook, I'm using an open textbook, and that means I'll embed it in it, I'll take all the problems, all the examples, the simulations, etc. So they're reducing their cost because they don't have to develop the content, and they're passing that cost savings on to students. Yeah. If one's using an open textbook as a supplement to the class notes, yep. that, there's no problem with that. Just give links to students and say, here you go. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, and um, that's, that's a lot. When we first started, that was a huge use case. People, they, we were new. They wanted to make sure it, was, it, was, it met the needs. And so that's a great point, and I didn't make it. I should have made it earlier. Uh, so we, talk, we talked about if you cannot get to agreement to move to OER, how do we still help students? You use the word OER, you mention it to the publisher, and they'll, they'll lower the I guarantee it. Uh, the second thing that you can do is uh, you can um, give students a choice. It, it, you, we haven't been in this um, uh, forced adoption model really for that long in, in the history of education. You can make the OER recommended, make it a recommended reading. Just expose it to the student mm -hmm. and, and see how they like it. Uh, that will at least give the students who can't afford the materials in the first two weeks of class before they get their Pell Grant check, at least access to resources. And since most of today's new OER is aligned, a scope and sequence, uh, the, the students won't notice the big difference. Now they may come and ask you, well, do I really have to spend the $300 or the $250 on the economics book? Uh, and then, you know, that's a conversation you can have with them. Uh, but just make it recommended if you can't come to an agreement. That's fine. No, I'm using it as a supplement. Okay, that's materials. perfect. So yeah. They're not paying anything. That's perfect. That's great. Great, great. I look forward to see the actual examples in use. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. We have now some examples um, of implementing OER um, here at UTSA, and uh, Dr. Lorenzo Brontaleon is going to talk about his implementation in Physics for Scientists, uh, Physics 1943, to share a little bit of how that looks in his class. Thank you. All right, <coughs> so let's get to the actual you know, implementation of some of these tools. Uh, so I tested this for the first time uh, for the introductory calculus based physics class. And basically, as you see, I didn't have you know, particularly high expectations, but they are, I think they're reasonable, and, and I'll make that clear in a second. So to give you an idea, I had 95 students uh, initially registered which is consistent with our typical class size for that class, you know, between 90 and 100. Uh, I audited several times since 2003, and I taught other introductory physics classes, whether it was the second semester or the algebra base, so roughly I teach one introductory physics class every right, for a year. <coughs> so I basically taught for almost 800 students just for their calculus-based physics one class. And I've always used traditional textbooks paired with tools like Master in Physics and Web Assign. Uh, so I treated this as an experiment in a way. So 
I could have changed like 100 different parameters, and uh, but then you have to do like the data analysis of that would be nearly impossible. So I wanted to keep everything pretty much as similar as possible to what I did before and just change the textbook. So go from my traditional textbook to uh, the, open, the OER textbook. Okay? So, <clears throat> what were the motivation to change? Uh, well, first of all, because I'm always looking for something new, something to improve the way I teach, something to improve how the uh, students perform. At the same time, I happen to believe that the cost of education, of our education, are really, you know, way too high. So whatever I can do to help uh, students lower their cost, I'm happy to do it. And recently, I started to experience something I didn't experience before. So I used Master in Physics, I used uh, uh, Web Assign, and I had to give in complete to students who came to me and said, look, I can't buy master access to Master in Physics this semester. I cannot buy uh, access to Web Assign. Right? So that made me think, hey, okay, there's something wrong there, right, in, in the way we are uh, delivering this. Uh, and really, I see it, and with David this morning, we kind of talked about it. I kind of looked at it as a first step uh, to actually get completely free of even these uh, tools, right? Where the students wouldn't have to pay for anything, right? Even for the uh, online tools. And the thing that convinced me is that when I reviewed, so one of my colleagues, well, I'm not the first one in physics. Uh, trying this out, uh, I said, you know, you should look at it, and the textbook is pretty good. In fact, I had a look at it, and the textbook has, to me, the level at which the textbook introduced the topics was actually higher than the traditional textbooks. The level of details, the type of examples were pretty good. Now, I told David that there are other things that he's like, but mm -hmm. hopefully those will be uh, uh, addressed in the future. So just to give you an, <coughs> an example, my class was a uh, three meeting a week. And by the way, that's one reason why it's difficult to uh, um, match up the textbooks because some of us teach like twice in five minutes, some of us teach like three times in 50 minutes. And here is how I organize it. So first day I tell the students always, you know, there's 100 of you, I can't make 100 people happy. Okay, there's no way. So what I do, I break my class down in sections so that, you know, some would be happy with some part, some would be happy with another part. So on Monday we would meet and I would have a regular lecture. Like, on Wednesday I would meet and work out problems because, you know, this is a class mostly made of engineers and uh, science major and, you know, they need the problem solving uh, uh, examples that they can work. And then on Friday I would make them work in groups. I would assign problems and what I call assisted peer instruction because the work, the groups, which were larger than three people each, what three students is, we are assisted by myself, an SI leader, and uh, one of the senior physics undergraduates. Okay, so we go around and make them work and you know move them along and answer questions and so on and so forth. So. Uh, this is important for a lot of physics classes to do this type of diversified work and really, really make them uh, work on their like uh, critical thinking skills, right? Because basically, what I tell them, I hope I don't offend anybody, but you know, a calculus, you go through calculus, and <coughs> literally, the way you do it, you go through checkpoints, and if you don't mess up in between, most of the time you're right. But in physics, I cannot give you a recipe to, to solve a problem, right? You have a problem, you have to figure it out yourself. I can give you strategies, that's all I can do. So that's why they needed to, uh, to practice. And then another thing that I did, but not exclusive to this class, that's what I was telling you before. I just wanted to change one thing, which was the text. I do some extra work, let's say. So I create content, either in the form of recorded lectures, or I'll uh, make it go as a background here or something pop up at some point. Or <coughs> 572. Sorry. Right? <coughs> you have that we're now uh, uh, time this. Right? So I post 
additional material, right, that I cannot cover in class. And I post solutions to the problem, or selected problems, right, so that they have these extra examples, which basically means that, you know, in whatever it is, 15 weeks, an hour and a half each week, or whatever it is, two and a half hours each week, we cannot all cover everything. So I added this content online for them uh, to keep working on things and come and ask me if they have any problems. So, having said that, you know, I, can, I then start to observe, you know, what were the positive results, what were the negative results. So they start with the negative results. Uh, one thing that I've mentioned today is that at least for this particular textbook, the problems that the students were given at the end of the textbook, even if the examples and the topics were at a, a very high level, the problems were repetitive, okay? So which basically meant that I had to really be creative in, in, give them, in giving them you know, enough uh, variation in terms of the type of problems that they, uh, that they were about. There are some mistakes, but nothing that is unusual for any other textbooks. Uh, that at least that I've used. And some topics were skipped or not discussed as much in detail as I would have liked, but again, those are, it's room for improvement. As I said, the level in which some of the topics were treated was actually superior to a regular textbook and we use, you know, very, very traditional textbooks. Uh, the amount of details was really, really <coughs> good. Uh, and again, the choice of example, which is sort of striking uh, uh, contrast with the problem at the end of the chapter, but the examples embedded in the text were actually very useful and very good. So, here I basically put need versus perception because I want to see exactly what is the need and what is we think is a need. So if you look at it, unfortunately only 20 of the students responded to the uh, uh, survey. And only one of 20 basically ever dropped the course because of the price of that. However, if you look at the other column, basically they appreciated, well, maybe it was already pointed out, right? The fact that it's available anywhere, anytime. Uh, accessibility is a big thing, right? Somebody pointed out that they didn't have to spend uh, as much money as for buying a regular textbook. Uh, the quality is great. So the, the comments were mostly uh, positive. And what was the result on the class itself? So basically, this is, was my low bar in a sense, but I think it's the only bar, as far as I'm concerned, is that there is no adverse effect. That's what I wanted to test, right? So if I switch from Young and Friedman or Survey or some other traditional textbook to, uh, to this, to OpenStax, you know, do you get that results. Well, the results clearly show that it is. And so what you see is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven there are the different times I taught this class chronologically. So I forgot exactly which year they were, so I left it that, that way. Uh, now, as you see, if you look at the red bar, I used to be um, John's uh, blacklist most of the time because my DRW rate was really red really high. What? The red list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and with, you know, I slowly started to improve based also on this additional material that, that I created, hopefully. But as you see, you know, that DFW rate didn't automatically show up again just because I switched to open stats. If at all, it improved a little bit. Uh, and even, you know, in terms of the grade distribution, wasn't really, uh, uh, you know, wasn't adversely affected by, by the use of uh, um, open stuff. So basically that reached my goal, you know, to the point that yeah, you know, I'm converted. I can use open stacks uh, for any other class. In terms of the response of the students, I just posted that for your own amusement. But the reality is that there wasn't a single comment in all the comments that I received from the students, there wasn't a single comment that commented on using open stacks. Now, it could be a bad thing, which we all know, the students never open a book, so it doesn't matter which book <laughs> you're actually adopting. But the other thing is that it clearly didn't affect them, right? So I thought that that was also positive. 
Uh, in, you know, as terms of impression recommendation, we certainly recommend uh, OER to anybody who wants to use it. In whichever format you want, right? As main text or as ancillary material. Uh, there is also a comparable to your traditional textbook. Uh, and so the students have the benefit of not having to pay for it. Uh, one thing that comes up, at least in physics, but it could, for instance, come up in chemistry or you know, in many you know, introductory classes, that you know, people don't want to change their slides. They don't want to change their lecture. Well, introductory physics has been the same for 100 years. So you can still use your slides. Okay? <laughs> the material is exactly the same. You don't have to change that. And as David said, now there, there is more material available uh, uh, where you can actually use the slides that Open uh, provides. Now, I think in, there is some work to be done. And we met this morning, I was pointing out, you know, uh, for instance, for us, the better selection of problems, or uh, uh, varied problems. Uh, some topics could be, uh, uh, you know, treated a little bit differently. There is a need again to develop ancillary tools, but I'm still learning. So these 146 additional, you know, material, I wasn't completely aware of that. So now I'm going to look into that. And what I would like to see, and I kind of pointed out, is that this should also be developed for upper division courses, right? At least for some of them. Certainly in STEM, right? Because I know physical chemistry, organic chemistry, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, those are all classes that have still large audiences, you know, nationwide, right? And the material is pretty sad. There is no, you know, no real large variability there. So I hope to see that at some point in the future or some collaboration that moves us in that direction. And finally, I would like to acknowledge both Dianne and Matt, who, you know, just to point out, when you, when you adopt these texts, you're not alone. So you have a lot of support, and they're being absolutely great in providing, you know, support beyond uh, uh, what I, you know, even needed. Uh, so I would really, really uh, like to thank them for uh, the support you gave. So if you have any questions, uh, so unless we leave them in the end. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I had a question about the OER grant, and maybe we'll get to this later in the, the conversation. But I'd like to know what you use the funding for. Like, how did that help you to redevelop your course using OpenStax book? In this case, I just modernized the uh, equipment to record the additional material. Uh, so that's basically what I used it for. Uh, I guess at that point it becomes very much, you know, uh, discipline specific, right? On what you want to do. So for me, that was the priority. Uh, still a lot of work to be done there, but you know, editing a little bit better. They're not super professional. What I post is not super professional. So, uh, so that's where I invested that. But again, I think this is different disciplines we have different needs. Yeah, I was asking that you have some recorded lectures. What program do you use? Then? Well, that was, uh, it's called Camtasia. Camtasia. And nowadays, uh, the newer version actually allows you to compress and edit better your videos. Uh, you can, you know, I post it like that without my face, because they don't see my better if they don't see my face. Uh, but the video, you know, the actual recording of an image would make it giant files and then people that like what you get mad at me. So basically what I record is the syncing of the screen with the recording. That makes MP4 files that are, you know, fairly manageable. And it too, it doesn't, you know, it takes me a while, meaning, you know, over time I've built a database of these videos, not just for the intro classes, but for the upper division classes too. Right? So I don't know, over the summer I may spend like one day a week recording this and all, you know, slowly I build up a dozen days of this. But for the problems, for instance, the students really seem to appreciate that. Right? Thank you so much. Thank you.
Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Crystal Colombini from the Department of English to talk about her implementation of Open Resources OER in um, English 4433 Advanced Professional Writing. Hi, everyone. So I um, will just stand around over here and not over there because I'm too twitchy to stand kind of podium. Um, but I have a little, a few little things I'll just um, share with you here if you guys don't mind just passing those around um, in case you're interested. Um, so, uh, um, as Tina mentioned, I teach writing classes, and the place that I implemented the um, open access resources is in a class called um, English 4433. Actually, and I'll just steal one of those back because I kind of want to have one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we teach a professional writing class, and so I think I'm hoping that a little bit of what I talk about, um, or maybe a lot, will be relevant to all of you, no matter what you teach, because of course, um, all of us ideally want to get more writing into our courses and most of us pragmatically are struggling with the realities of that and so um, I think potentially uh, I mean my classes obviously are writing intensive classes they are sort of designated as places where we do writing in this university um, but I also think that some of the things that I'll talk about a little bit um, maybe point to some ways that people teaching different kinds of courses um, can integrate a little bit more engagement in that way and, and potentially ways that make it easy and, and, and manageable for them. Um, so just a little bit about my course. Um, this was actually a course that's been on our books in the English department for a while, and it was sort of being taught in all these random ways, and the, the, those of us who are in the curriculum area um, of, of rhetoric and professional writing is what we call it, a professional writing and rhetoric, um, kind of got together and we decided that this class would be um, a capstone experience, essentially, for students who are um, finishing up in English or in professional writing rhetoric, um, but it's also been really attractive to students across the disciplines. I've gotten a lot of students from psychology, a lot of students from uh, medical humanities, a lot of students from communications, uh, a lot of law students. And so this is a 25 student class. I'm not, I can't brag the big savings numbers like some of you, um, but I will say actually, I have a little bit of like a kind of response to that rhetoric just because I am working really personally with students who are finishing up here at UTSA. Nearly all of them are applying for graduate school. They're applying for law schools. They are um, facing the sort of you know um, onset of student loan payments. And um, I think that I see really I've, what I've seen is that you know not having to purchase a textbook affects them on a personal level in a really positive way. And so um, you know I, I think if you're teaching smaller classes, don't. I would say, no, no offense, Dia, but you know, that's just as important, I think, um, to our students as, as having in a large lecture class where you can really tabulate some enormous savings. Um, uh, my students have been really, really, really excited and really positive about um, not having to purchase a textbook. Um, technical and professional writing textbooks are, are quite expensive. And the downside, and some of you may be experiencing this if you teach anything where students are coming from different areas or, um, you know, doing sort of different kinds of things, is that, um, you know, textbooks can only present one generalized perspective, right? And of course, um, things are changing all the time, right? I mean, for example, in writing studies, even to teach something like, uh, you know, the genre of a business letter or a memo or something like that, that's not even really possible anymore. We just don't do that really anymore because these things are changeable. They're dynamic. They're always shifting and they're very situational. I mean, uh, you know, I know scientists and and, and you know whatever you guys hate these rhetoric people because of everything's situational to us, everything's changeable, right? Um, but um, I mean, yes, we don't hate us. It's a strong word, but you know, um, I think we see things as very situated, and so we try to teach students in that way, right? You know, how can you get out into the world and apply this, thinking about how it might work in this particular situation? So again, you know, the sort of just to go back to the sort of goals of this particular course. Um, I'm really looking at sort of professionalizing. This is this is one of the last places we see our students before they graduate UTSA and they leave us. They're you know usually the semester I have them, whether it's fall or spring, nearly all of them are graduating that semester, and they're really thinking about how to look back on their experience at UTSA and sort of um, bring it together in some kind of cumulative story. Um, so I have been really lucky um, in terms of you know having having a field um, that's that's very supportive of open access resources. Um, my field, we would sort of call ourselves rhetoric and composition or writing studies or, or composition and rhetoric, depending on your affiliation. Um, but there's a big movement in my field toward open access resources, both in terms of uh, teaching resources and in terms of scholarship. And people are really pushing for some of the scholarship to match with this um, sort of pedagogical impetus toward more open access resources. And the good news for any of you that do anything with writing or want to send students to any kind of resource about writing is that writing people, writing studies people, writing experts are putting lots and lots of resources online. So 
probably most of you are familiar with sites like Purdue's OWL website, right? If you don't want your students to have to buy a Chicago handbook or an APA handbook or an MLA handbook, hey, go look at Purdue's OWL. The people who maintain that site, they are specialists, they are PhD students, and they are actively working on making sure that everything's updated, that the resources are very accessible. So probably most of you, no matter what field you're in, you're aware of some of that. Um, but there's also quite a lot more. So the site that I've used, Dan, do you want me to pull it up? Yeah. One of the main sites that I found helpful is the writing comments. And again, um, I'll share this with you just because I think it could be relevant to other people than just people in writing. Um, it's just an example of one of the places where scholars of writing are putting things online meant to help students with a variety of different kinds of, of, um, of work. So um, if you were to come to the site, you would see that there's chapters on just general things, writing process, editing, you know, uh, sentence structure, grammar, point of view, mechanics, writing theses, uh, you know, it, it styles, uh, you know, you name it, right? And then also a lot more um, kind of contemporary things like creating digital, um, you know, digital compositions, right? Things like infographics, videos. Um, I do a lot of that in my class. Posted, you know, data, data visualizations. How do you create good data visualizations? So even for those of you in the sciences and math, if you're working with, you know, talking to your students about ethical representations of data, um, you may find some, some, you know, helpful sources in, in sites like this. And then for me, a lot of things about memos, proposals, reports. And what's great about a site like this is that it gives students, um, for me in my class, it gives us sort of a core of stability in terms of, yeah, hey, we still kind of have a textbook. This is one of our core resources. We come to it a lot. Um, you know, we trust the discourse. It's analytical. It's oriented towards students. And so what I've been able to do as I redesign my class is, um, so if you guys see on the back edge of this handout, um, I'm sort of seeing my approach to online access resources in my class in two ways. One was adapting my existing assignments and work to be supported by these things. So um, things I already teach, like one of my projects in this class is a client-based project where students prepare a, um, a, 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 a memo report, an infographic, and a video message. And I have a couple handouts of this assignment if anybody's, in, if anybody's interested. But I find a, a lot of great stuff up here that you know, helps, helps us talk about, okay, what does it look like to write a report? You know, what, what do we do when we're citing? Um, how do we do research when we do projects like this? Um, but then also what I can do is draw on other things that help students situate and interpret in different situations. So, uh, you know, I have a psychologist. I have someone in medical humanities. I have someone in professional writing. I have someone who wants to be a technical writer. I have someone who wants to go to law school. So I can say, okay, here are some, ge some general information. And then I can say, okay, go find some more open access resources that help you understand how that genre gets tailored in your field. And so that's what I do a lot of in my class is I, I establish a set of shared online access resources and then I send them out to find other things that help them modify and adjust their perspective. And so this works basically in every assignment I do in my class. How do people write reports in your field? What, do, what are the trends in resume writing in your field? What are, um, you know, what are some of the ways that you know, people talk to clients and propose work for clients in your field? And so I think just for me, being oriented toward what we can find online has helped me um, find ways to be more accommodating when I think about different disciplinary differences and ways that I can kind of um, help students see how things work situationally um, in you know, sort of different kinds of things rather than trying to internalize some sort of set message about writing or set message about a genre, right? I mean, the truth is that depending on the situation, you're gonna write differently. And so that's what I think open access resources for me has been really helpful. And then the second way that I've um, integrated some open access resources, um, I think, I guess what I would say, the second thing I've kind of done, the second prong of my approach, has been also to adapt new assignments that would help, um, that would kind of support, or like, you know, adapt new assignments that would kind of be oriented and more, more driven toward um, available information. And so for me, one of those has been a profession blog. Um, I have a, a couple, you know, a couple, um, examples of that assignment too, if anybody's interested in seeing it. Um, and also I have a couple examples of a post that I graded today when I was grading the students' blog projects. So what I have them do for this project, it's an online project throughout the course, or I mean, sorry, a continuing project throughout the course. I have them um, in start a blog, and as we talk about different professional communication issues through the class, they blog weekly to an audience of professionals about that issue as it affects their field. So they're thinking about things like, how do we write effective proposals again? Or um, how do we deal, what, you know, what are some ethical communication issues in our field? Um, how, do we, um, 
how do we deal with things like um, you know, data design or, or data visualization? And they, they write online and they write to an audience, an, an imagined audience in their field. And this has been great because there are tons of resources online, not necessarily under the rubric of a textbook, right, but just kind of available things, um, both in terms of instruction, how do you blog, how do you blog for professional purposes, and also in terms of um, models, right? So rhetorical models. This is one of those places, I don't know if you guys have noticed this about UTSA students. Um, when I first got here, I started getting asked almost right away, like, but can you show us, can you show us an example? Like, you know, don't just give us the instruction, show us an example. So I got wise to that and started saving student examples every semester for, so that the next time I talk, you know, ask, ask a student who had a really good project, hey, can I share this next time? And now I have a bank of student examples. Um, which I think the students really appreciate. For some reason, where I came from, I just, you know, I never heard so much, can I see a model, can I see a model? And I get a lot of that here. And so for me, what I find is that when I do a project like a profession blog, I get, it's a place where students can synthesize some of the learning we do. Um, they are thinking also themselves about the value of putting knowledge and ideas online, right? Like, the sort of like paying, you know, paying it out to the world how can I share my knowledge with the world in ways that may help other people like me or maybe people slightly behind me in this process? Um, you, know, it, you know, but also not, 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 not just as a sort of an altruistic um, you know, action, but also as, um, also as a way of developing a professional standing and a professional identity. And so that's one of my big goals in this particular course is that I want students to come out of here feeling like they have a professional identity that they can say, like, hey, here's who I became, here's what I bring to the table, right? The idea of personal branding, you know, it's such a marketized idea, and I'm a little critical of it in some ways, but I think, um, I think it's a big part of today's workforce is being able to kind of identify and talk about who we are uniquely, not just I'm an accountant or I can do this thing, but also like I'm passionate for this thing, I bring this to the table. And so um, what I found is that there's a lot of stuff out there between, again, just sort of the more traditional textbook type discourse, but also this sort of like broad conversation on professional writing and um, professional identity, professional voice, and that really is open to variation of discipline. I think when you start to look for these things, that's where you start to see even, you know, because I have had students from art history actually in this class, and they, you know, they, they, they sometimes at first say, well, I don't know, how do, how do I write a resume in art history? And I go, I go, look, well, all of a sudden they can find things, and there are people out there saying, hey, here's what art historians should do when they, when they do X, Y, and Z. Um, and so again, I think that it helps, um, it's been really helpful just in orienting me toward the world of what's out there on the internet that could help my teaching and help my students. Um, um, so yeah, I've been really appreciative of that. It's been, it's been great. Um, you know, to your question earlier about like, what did this help you do? I think sometimes just having the support of a grant is about establishing mental space, right? Like, how can I afford to give this, this time to this when I would give it to, to something else, right? Um, so I haven't personally translated um, my support into anything, um, I guess, other than conference attendance, which, you know, helps me, um, you know, sort of learn about this in my field more generally. But also I think it's just like, this is going to take time, right? How can, I, how can I get rid of this textbook and sort of divest it from my, my syllabus? How can I reintegrate these other things? And how do I change my assignments as a result? And um, I think, again, just being able to be supported by the grant is really helpful in terms of just making the space to do that. I've kind of felt guilty for a long time that I hadn't done more of this in my class, and so now I'm like, yes, I'm like at the forefront and the cutting edge of this wonderful open access resource stuff. So I'm really appreciative of the support. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I, I do have to step out, but I will leave this up in case anybody is interested in looking at any of that, and feel free to contact me if you have any more questions. Oh, I should ask if there's any questions. No. Okay. <laughs> have a good one. Okay, I do have one. Uh, so the um, this resource here, in terms of scope and sequence and depth and coverage, is it similar to what you were using with a, uh, a commercial textbook? Very much. And again, it's probably because the people who are writing and contributing to this, it's multiple contributors, but they're all experts, you know, PhDs in the field. Yeah. And uh, they are the same kind of people who would be writing textbooks, okay. only they've sort of had the realization that, hey, we should be doing more to democratize and, and open access. And it's openly licensed, right? Yeah. 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 Right. And it's not, this is not the only one. Um, another thing that's mentioned on the handout is that um, there are publishers in my field who are starting to publish solely open access resources as well. So the WAC Clearinghouse is another one. All the textbooks of everything they publish are available. So sometimes if I need a little bit more of a critical, like a scholarly perspective, I'll yeah. pull from there. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm lucky. I know not everyone has access to this kind of stuff, but it is very helpful. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Crystal.
Yeah, and our grant recipients have used the grant fund in a lot of different ways, but um, the popular one is, of course, travel conferences. Um, some have purchased um, tools to help them with teaching a variety of, and they've used it in a variety of ways, which so really does come back to the discipline. Um, Rita Mitra from cybersecurity is not able to join us today. Her mother has been very ill, but she did um, create a video for us to kind of explain a little bit about how she's incorporated OER into her IS uh, 1001 Inside Cyber course. So I'll go ahead and um, show that now. It's about 10 minutes. Hi, I'm Rita Mitra, and uh, my grant from the UTS Library this year covers a course called Inside Cyber in the Information Systems and Cybersecurity Department. A little bit about me, I teach in that department, but half of my current course load involves designing and developing the online curriculum for the Bachelor's of Business Administration degree in cybersecurity. Uh, the curriculum progression was determined before I came on board and partially scoped out. Uh, and this course was initially designed to fill a one hour gap in a 20 hour, uh, in a 40 hour curriculum. Uh, its aim, other than filling that one hour gap, is to introduce essential concepts of cybersecurity to cybersecurity and information systems majors. Uh, it is a required course for those majors uh, and open to any student at the university as well who, who is wanting to learn more about the field. The initial design relied on a publisher textbook in management information systems, and it cost around $200. Uh, I didn't feel right about using that textbook because it seemed too high a cost for a one hour course, and because it doesn't cover cybersecurity per se. Um, so cybersecurity is a fairly new field, and the issues and technology associated with it change rapidly. It would be difficult to near impossible for any standard publisher textbook to keep up with what's happening currently in the field. And the very nature of the field demands staying current. Um, and in addition, the costs associated with this should be minimal, um, at least from a textbook standpoint. Any student cost would ideally be limited to buying a new gadget, uh, that students can tinker with going forward, such as uh, Raspberry Pi, um, or by purchasing an online lab package. And originally the second uh, was probably what I was leaning towards, but actually we found a set of very interesting OER lab resources that may be able to be utilized in this course and other courses. Um, so I'll just go through briefly kind of um, uh, some uh, aspects of the course and what we've learned during this iteration. So I already mentioned the benefits of using OER resources um, in this course. Uh, what are some of the challenges of using OER resources? Uh, one challenge is due to the fact that cybersecurity is really a combination of a number of fields. So if we're drawing from existing OER texts, we need to curate and consolidate uh, material from computer science, information systems, engineering, business management, psychology, criminal justice, etc. And in addition, um, to keep up to date, we must not only access recent journal articles, but link out to recent articles in the news. Um, another challenge is that targeted assessments for this field don't uh, yet exist, and so uh, we have to create them from scratch. And because the course is refreshed every semester to a certain extent, these assessments must also be revised. And finally, the source list can be overwhelming to students, uh, not necessarily as reading material, but as assessment material. So how can we mitigate against this, these issues? Uh, one strategy is to streamline the number of textbooks or other articles and find a few quality resources with more content. Um, recently, I found a delightful computer science text that I can use across two courses. I've provided the link at the end of the uh, 
presentation. Another improvement I've been making on each iteration is to include links as sources, but only assess content that's provided within the presentation material of the course. That way, it's clear to students what they need to study for quizzes and what they can read as optional material. Um, on the challenge of updating assessments, one idea that's frequently used uh, by others as well is to have students come up with new assessments for extra credit. I post announcements once or twice a week uh, with new reading material based on what's happened that specific week. Um, and these are likely uh, uh, resources that I'll use in the next iteration of the course. So for extra credit, students can read these and compose a few autograded questions that I'll then um, check and, and tailor for the next iteration. Um, and finally, I reviewed evaluation surveys from the university as well as those provided by DN for the fall, and both have been hugely helpful. Uh, one of the major takeaways is that in the short term, uh, we need to provide one landing spot for all accessible content. And in the long term, uh, I'd like to create an OER text specifically for an introductory cybersecurity course. So I wanted to just highlight uh, some additional benefits of this project. One is that based on feedback, we've seen that this course is filling some gaps in curricular knowledge and leveling incoming competencies. Uh, also, I provide three journals for reflections on a topic of interest and a couple of discussion boards uh, in Blackboard. So in these, students have brought up their career interests and what they'd like to focus on in the program as a whole. As a result, uh, the department is planning to permutate, permutate this course to a three-hour one to address uh, the gaps and the background needed for the higher level courses and also to address student interest in the program as a whole. Finally, we can trickle down some of the content in the higher level courses and avoid redundancies in those courses by moving common core tasks to this course, thereby allowing those higher level courses to focus on uh, their specific topic. Uh, another benefit is the use of the grant money itself. Uh, for this course, I've hired an undergraduate to test out and document instructions for an OER lab resource, the one I mentioned before, provided by the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, the labs are relevant across the curriculum, which is super exciting, but for this course, an introductory video game with scenarios um, and basic cybersecurity concepts is of particular interest. Um, so I deeply appreciate the opportunity to test it out with a student before deploying it next semester. Uh, fi and finally, one of the unanticipated benefits for me while researching for OER resources are the relationships and potential partnerships uh, that can be made with OER providers. Uh, the lab resource I mentioned above is one such partnership. Uh, the Naval Postgraduate School has indicated that we're free to modify their labs and supply revisions to them to include as part of their library. I'll end by providing a uh, peek at our Blackboard shell for this course. Uh, students entered via the announcements page. So as I mentioned, I, I post relevant links and um, material from that week and announcements. And the coursework is under this tab. Uh, you go to a table of contents and the modules are listed. Uh, each module has a number of lessons. If you click on a lesson, you're taken out to a soft chalk application, um, which is an application that uh, any UTSA faculty can use uh, to curate and consolidate content. So uh, you can include videos, links, images, uh, whatnot. Um, and then the final course project is a tabletop exercise, um, which involves finding an event, a cyber event, and documenting what's happened, who was involved, uh, writing a report on uh, takeaways, 
lessons learned on how to prevent this attack in the future. And then a, prese a presentation on, on the event is uh, posted on a peer discussion board for review. Then they have an opportunity to revise their presentation based on feedback. Uh, thank you to the library for providing this grant in order to scope out uh, uh, new OER resources. It's been hugely helpful and I really appreciate it. Next we have uh, Luca Pazzi from the Department of Anthropology to talk a little bit about how um, he's led the effort in the intro, um, an intro um, to biological anthropology course to use OER. Um, and worked with other faculty to make that happen. Uh, hey, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and uh, sharing my experience. Uh, so as I said, I'm an assistant professor in the uh, anthropology department. I've been at UTC for two and a half years. And I'm gonna sh want to share a little bit of experience that we had in our department in developing a textbook free curriculum for introduction to biological anthropology. So I want to give you a little bit um, <coughs> uh, um, background about this class. Uh, this is, of course, a foundational course in our uh, curriculum, in anthropology curriculum. It's one of the many different introductions to anthropology that we have, uh, and this is like a subfield of biological anthropology specifically. Uh, it's, of course, a required class uh, for everybody who is a major in anthropology, but what is really important for us in this particular case is that it's also uh, part of the core curriculum. So it actually meets the life and science, um, and life and physical science component. So that means that we have a lot of students because every time the students have to take a class for a requirement in science, uh, they see biological anthropology and say, oh, that's an easy one. And so I'm gonna take this one and then they realize that it's not that easy. But, um, <clears throat> but if we have a lot of students, so we could actually serve a lot of students we'll see in a little bit. Another f uh, important aspect of this class is that everybody in our department that is a biological anthropologist teach this class across uh, the board. So uh, no matter if you are assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, and we also have a lot of non-tenure track um, um, uh, faculty that are teaching this class, including some of our graduate students, particularly during the summer uh, semester. So we have a like, diverse uh, group of uh, faculty that has very different uh, experience. Just to give you some statistics about this class, uh, we usually offer between four and five different sections of this class uh, every semester in the spring and in the fall semester, and two sections usually in the summer. It's a little bit more available during the summer, depending on availability of uh, teachers. Um, anthropologists don't really like to teach over the summer uh, because they actually go in the field. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we have a little bit more uh, problems to offer class in the summer. But we do have roughly between three and four hundred students that they take this class every semester. Uh, really fluctuate a little bit. Uh, we do have usually more students during the fall semester than uh, during the uh, spring semester. And so when we started thinking about uh, developing a class without a textbook, uh, we had two major goals. And first, uh, one of them was, of course, reducing cost, as we'll see in a little bit, and that's kind of common across all the uh, speakers today, and I guess it's one of the major uh, idea of um, OER in the first place. But the other one was also to try to create a textbook or at least uh, content that we could be uh, always up to date. Um, and we'll see that this specific on our own uh, discipline in a way. So cost reduction, just to give you an idea, uh, the cost of like textbooks are very expensive. They're probably not as expensive as like bio or physics or other uh, textbook, but still they, they so range between 100 and $170. Uh, probably a little bit less today if you can actually uh, get access to e-books and things like that, but still probably around like at least 50, 70, uh, uh, dollars per textbook. Um, since a lot of people are taking this as a requirement, you also to consider the fact that these students will never use that textbook again. Uh, they would never open the textbook again, even if they open it during the class. And that's just a question that we can discuss about it. It's a different workshop, though. Um, but uh, they will never really benefit from it after this class, very likely. Um, and so, given the number of students that we had, we estimate that 
between 30 and 55,000 uh, dollars can be spent, technically, potentially, by UTSA students every semester for biological college. So that's a pretty big chunk of money here. In um, particular, for, if you think about the demographic of our, uh, of our student. The other aspect that I think is very relevant about our discipline is that biological anthropology is a very fast developing discipline. You probably heard about like new fossils that have been discovered in the human lineage, or like new advances over ancient DNA in understanding how Neanderthal are related to modern humans and how we hybridize, or all the things about personal genomics and you know sending your saliva samples to 23andMe and getting the results and getting everything about your ancestry. Uh, and what you really are. This is all major anthropological question that we have that we want to share with the students and we want to talk about it in our class because they're really like related to their life in a way. Um, and so because of that, uh, we want to have the very latest version of a textbook that is always up to date. Because of that, what is happening is that um, it's also hard to find use because we always, teachers tend to use always the very latest version of it. And the old one can be actually not fully uh, useful for them because there are some parts that are uh, missing depending on who's teaching. So how this project worked out? Well, interesting enough, I started myself uh, as an individual thinking about a textbook fee project as soon as I uh, joined UTC uh, in uh, fall of 2016. And I really wanted to do it because of the reason above, but also because I teach this class in a very different way from any other person that I know. Uh, so I flip all the different topics around a little bit. And because of that, the textbook really didn't give me like a one-to-one -one correspondence between what I was teaching and what it was covering the textbook. So I was not really satisfied by any of the textbooks textbooks out there. We started developing a uh, first free uh, textbook free curriculum in fall 2016 for only one section. We eventually got a grant from the library uh, in the spring of 2017. And so by 2000, uh, the fall of 2017, we were able to apply our uh, textbook free curriculum to all the different section in uh, introduction to biological anthropology. So everybody that is teaching introduction to biological anthropology in our department today is teaching this class without a textbook. It's part of one of like, the things that we sort of made common across um, the full curriculum. So meaning that uh, since the implementation of this uh, particular curriculum, we have been told over 1,800 uh, students, meaning that we probably save around uh, $180,000 uh, for uh, these students because they don't have to buy a textbook. So the material hasn't been easy to find because at the moment there's no like a real good EOR uh, for uh, biological anthropology. Uh, and at least when we started, there was almost nothing out uh, there in 2017. So what we created, it was create a sort of like a different set of chapters, a sort of like a virtual uh, textbook with different chapters coming from different articles that were available online. One of the very good resources was Nature um, Education Knowledge Project, if you're not aware of that, but uh, is a project by uh, uh, Nature, uh, the magazine, <coughs> that it basically has uh, a lot of different section in a lot of different fields, including evolutionary biology and biological anthropology. And these are written by um, uh, scientists, by researchers, uh, but in a very, very easy uh, way. So they have different uh, levels, from beginner to intermediate to advanced, and so you can pick whatever uh, topic you like for your particular uh, and also we created a, a set of resources that are multimedia, so that we combine some uh, chapters and some videos together, so to give them a little bit also an experience that is multimodal to the student, more like than a normal uh, textbook. Um, when we were developing this class, they eventually published uh, this particular book, uh, The History of Our Tribe, of Nini. This is actually an open access uh, book. Uh, that is available. It kind of fills, fulfills some of the requirements that we wanted, so we use some of this chapter. Uh, it's very based on like the fossil record, so we don't cover the fossil record so much in details. But we actually use some of these uh, chapters as well as part of our uh, curriculum. 
And finally, um, oh, first of all, you have an idea. At this stage, uh, <coughs> the, the text we created is a better set of links that we can change and arrange based according to what we want to teach. We have a lot of different resources. Uh, the major goal at this stage would be to create something that is more like a big uh, web page uh, where students can actually get and get all the information in the same place very easily and link to these different resources so they can actually uh, use it as a sort of a, um, uh, as a textbook or digital uh, textbook in that, uh, in that sense. Um, there is though now a book that has been uh, developed uh, and is in process to be released probably in fall uh, 2019 uh, and this is a, uh, indeed a multi-order peer review open access book in uh, introduction to biological anthropology it should be available between the summer and the fall of this year uh, and it's also being supported of course by a friend from uh, Minnesota uh, State in this case specifically so we might actually include this particular resource uh, as well in our uh, in our curriculum. <coughs> Uh, student responses, generally speaking, uh, students have been really appreciated. I couldn't find really a lot of comments, bad comments in my uh, evaluation or any evaluation regarding the fact that they didn't have a textbook. Uh, and I found a lot of students actually uh, thanking me about the fact that they didn't have to buy a, a book, uh, things like that. So I think that this is um, very important for the student. Uh, however, um, I want to also mention some of the challenges because I think this is really important, particularly when you don't have a very easy solution, when you don't have a real class like book that you can find open access and you're ready to go. Um, the main problem is that student needs structure. And these kind of readings that are a little bit sparse around the web might not give them like a full good structure to them. So it's very, very important that you organize them and you select them in a very, very uh, specific way. You provide them a way to get access to them as they would be like chapters of different uh, books. And also that those readings that you're actually selecting really introduce the student to the topic as a textbook chapter, in particular for an intra-class, like in this case, because otherwise the student can get lost. Uh, so that's kind of a problem that we uh, find. It's not very easy to find these uh, resources. One of the things that I've done uh, in terms to help some of the students is to provide an optional textbook the student can get access to if they really want to uh, uh, work on a textbook as a sort of a resource. Uh, so I'm not forcing them uh, to buy a textbook, but if they really crave the structure of a textbook, they have uh, an option. And the other thing is very important that some of the readings are comprehensive and self-explanatory because a lot of students might actually not attend class depending on your policy that you have in your class and you want to be sure that they can actually get access to that information even if they're not uh, attending, attending class. One of the benefits though is that I could really tailor my readings based on what I was actually teaching. Sometimes textbooks just cover a lot of things that we don't necessarily cover, that we don't is necessary or we want to skip, I could actually select readings that were really, really specific based on what we're reading. So creating my own personal text would be in that. Uh, in that and so this is pretty much uh, what I have to say about Introduction to Anthropology. If you have any questions, Yes. Um, so how the, so for the students, how does it impact have you seen any different results in how they do on text? And how closely are you set to the lines of the material that they're getting since it's so variable? So actually, uh, I, we didn't do like a proper, uh, you know, pre and post survey in that sense. What I would say though that um, uh, I didn't see any decrease in their um, performance. Actually, I would say that probably I saw some increase, but not because of them specifically, but because of us. Mm -hmm. We were more careful about selecting the readings mm -hmm. and matching my, our readings to the material, mm -hmm. and also be sure that they were reading them. Mm -hmm. So like testing them, uh, reading by reading. So for instance, in my case, I have reading quizzes for every single chapter that I assign. Mm -hmm. I think when you have a textbook, it's easier to just school like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, but never really 
try to figure out if the students are using the textbook or not. Why? Because I was so worried that something would have happened, that they didn't have enough resources. Mm -hmm. I really tried to be very careful. So you are creating assessments around the material? I created an assessment around the material. Problem. And so that helped me to just be more careful. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it, I can do the comparison because of that, because it's not the only thing that I changed right. over the course of the years. Uh, but yeah. Thank you so much, Luca. And I would like to thank David and all of our faculty that presented today, um, doing amazing work with OER. And I, I won't take a lot of time because I know we've gone over just a little bit, but I did want to show you um, the grant application page and talk a little bit about, um, I think I'll talk a little bit about our research guides in OER just to show you that. So if this is something you're thinking about doing for your class and you're not quite sure where to start, if you go to our research guides on the library homepage, you can search OER or you can just email me um, and I can send you some resources. So we have a couple of research guides that, pro that provide um, OER. So the open educational resources one is kind of more overall by discipline. So you can come here and you can kind of browse by area. So if you teach in education, you can expand that out. And what we try to do is provide OER here so that it's easier for you guys to find it. We know sometimes the discovery process is what trips you up in getting to the material. So we've tried to make this a little bit easier. And then we also have matches by classes as well. So these are for the top 100 high enrollment courses. So if you browse, if you teach a core class or an enrollment, a high enrollment course, a freshman course, it's very likely that you're going to be able to find some matches for your class if you pop over to the guide. Um, and what we're doing, the librarians, we have our ears to the listservs. We have, we follow a couple of distribution lists. There's a Spark dist distribution list. And then um, I'm also, of course, on the, we're the OpenStax partner. And we follow the OpenStax distribution list as well. So whenever new OER are available, we're keeping track of that. We're trying to share that out and let faculty know, let you guys know when there's something available for a class that you teach. So if there's not something available right now, it's very likely something will come available and we'll, we'll let you know. So you can always reach out to us um, and let us know. And the other thing we can do is if there's not an OER available for your class or for the area that you teach in, um, we can look at what can we do in the library to help out with that. So if you can give us your uh, current textbook ISB, ISBN, what we can do is look to see, can we get an ebook through the library? Can we get a subscription to a book that would be comparable to the one you're using? Or maybe can we get the one that you are currently using right now? And what we can do is make sure to up the number of users so that your students can all access it simultaneously so there aren't any access um, issues. So we can help out. We would love to help if you have any questions. If you go to, um, on, on the agenda, the back of it is a flyer that talks about the grant, and then there's a link at the bottom. And this is where you can apply. If you're thinking about doing it, um, you go to services, faculty services, you can also browse and get to our OER page. You're gonna see the content on this page is going to be filling out a lot more. What we're trying to do is work on um, recognizing our textbook heroes, and we're doing some retrospective collecting of profiles too, so if you were awarded a grant in 2017, um, you'll probably be hearing from us where we can add your profile here and talk a little bit about the work you're doing for your class. Um, I had a question from a faculty member just a minute ago. If it's a different course, same instructor, different course, will we award that? Yes, we will. So we want to just see growth with using this. You may or may not have noticed within the course search, there's also a low-cost textbook filter that's been applied been there. Um, what we're doing is through the grant program, we are letting the registrar know whenever classes are using OER through our grant program and then we're sharing that list of courses. So um, students are seeing that a little bit more now. And that was that was in accordance with the SB 810 bill that was passed last year, where, where universities need to make um, courses that are using free or low-cost learning materials um, more readily findable in the course search. So. Um, if you're thinking about applying, you can come to the application page, and we do have uh, individual grants, and then we also have group grants. So if you have other faculty that you're working with, like Luca in anthropology, 
you can look to see, work together to implement that in, across all sections of the course. And we would absolutely love to see those applications, especially for core classes, high enrollment courses. Um, those would, those would uh, be fantastic. Um, but if you do have any questions, I will go ahead and wrap up because we're about 14 minutes over. If you have any questions for David, feel free. He's here to answer any questions you have about OER. Um, and of course, all of our faculty presenters, you have their contact information. If you have questions about what they're doing, you can reach out to them directly via email and uh, let them know what the questions are. And if you have any questions for me, feel free to um, let me know. But I'd like to thank David and all of our